Chapter 11 Nitya Dharma and Idolatry On the western bank of the Bhagirati, in the Koladweep district of Navadweep, there is a famous village named Kulia Paharpur. At the time of Sriman Mahaprabhu, a highly respected and influential Vaishnava named Sri Madhava Das Chattopadhyaya, also known as Chakuri Chattopadhyaya, lived in that village. Chakuri Chattopadhyaya had a son named Srila Vamsi Vardhananda Thako. By the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Sri Vamsi Vardhananda had tremendous power and authority. Everyone addressed him as Vamsi Vardhananda Prabhu because they regarded him as an incarnation of Krishna's flute. He was renowned as a special recipient of Sri Vishnu Priya's mercy. After Sri Vishnu Priya's disappearance, Vangsi Prabhu transferred the deity whom she had worshipped from Sridham Mayapur and his descendants carried out the service of this deity for some time after that. However, when his descendants obtained the mercy of Sri Janava Mata and moved from Kulia Paharpura to Sri Pat Bhaganpara, the worship of the deity was continued in Kuliagram by the Saivites from Malancha. Kuliagram is situated on the opposite side of the Ganga from Prachina, Old Navadweep, and at that time included many small settlements, among which Chinardanga and a few others were quite famous. Once, a devotee merchant in Chinandanga arranged a great festival in the temple of Kulia Paharpura and issued invitations to many Brahmana pundits and all the Vaishnavas within the 32 square mile circumference of Navadweep. On the day of the festival, the Vaishnavas came from all directions. Sri Anantadas came from Sri Nashingapali. Gaurachandra Das Babaji came from Sri Mayapur. Sri Narayan Das Babaji came from Sri Bilva Bushkarini. The renowned Narahari Das came from Sri Modrum. Sri Paramahamsa Babaji and Sri Vaishnav Das came from Sri Godruma. And Sri Sachinandan Das came from Sri Samudraga. The Vaishnava's foreheads were decorated with vertical tilak markings, Udva Pundra, indicating that their bodies were temples of Sri Hari. On their necks they wore tulsi malas, and their limbs looked splendid, being stamped with the names of Sri Gora Nityananda. Some held Harina malas in their hands, and others loudly performed Sankirtan of the Mahamantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, to the accompaniment of Mridanga and cartels, and some danced continuously as they moved along chanting Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shivasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda. In the bodies of many of the Vaishnavas were seen the external manifestations of ecstasy, such as torrents of tears and hairs standing on end. While weeping, some called out fervently, O Gaura Kishore, Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when will you grant me a vision of your eternal pastimes in Navadweep? There were many groups of Vaishnavas who sang Sri Nam with the accompaniment of Mridanga and other instruments as they walked. The women of Kulia, who were also bhaktas of Sri Goranga, became astonished to see these spiritual emotions and praised the spiritual good fortune of the Vaishnavas. Proceeding in this way, the Vaishnavas arrived at the Natya Mandir, dancing Mandir, directly adjacent to the deity's altar. This was where Sriman Mahaprabhu would dance and perform Sankirtan. The merchant who was sponsoring the festival greeted all of them. As a symbol of submission, he wore cloth around his neck and fell at the Vaishnava's feet, expressing sentiments of great humility. When all the Vaishnavas were seated in the Natya Mandir, the temple Saivites brought prasad and flower garlands and placed them around their necks. The poetic shlokas of Sri Chaitanya Mangal were then melodiously chanted, and upon hearing the ambrosial leela of Sri Chaitanya Dev, the various sattvic abhavs further enhanced the forms of the Vaishnavas.
While they were thus absorbed in Premananda, the doorkeeper entered and addressed the authorities of the temple. The chief mullah of Satsaika Parangana is sitting outside the assembly hall with his associates and followers. He requests to have a discussion with some of the Vaishnava pundits. The temple authorities in turn informed the exalted pundit Babaji's that the mullah had arrived and desired to speak with them. As soon as the Vaishnavas received this news, due to a break in the flow of transcendental rasa, the mood of their assembly became overcast with dejection. Krishna Das Babaji Mahashai of Sri Madhyadvip inquired from the temple authorities, What is Mullah Sahib's intention? Knowing the Mullah's purpose, they replied, The Mullah Sahib wants to discuss some spiritual matters with the Vaishnava pundits. They added that the Mullah was the foremost amongst Muslim scholars and was highly respected by the Emperor of Delhi. Although always devoted to the promotion of his own religion, he was not in the least inimical or belligerent towards other religions. The temple authorities humbly requested that one or two Vaishnav pundits should come forward and discuss the Shastra with him to display the pre-eminence of the sacred Vaishnava Dharma. Some of the Vaishnavas felt inspired to speak with the Mullah Sahib, seeing an opportunity to propound Vaishnava Dharma. In the end, they decided amongst themselves that Gorachandra Das Pandit Babaji of Sri Mayapur, Vaishnav Das Pandit Babaji of Sri Godaram, Prem Das Babaji of Janunaga, and Kaliya Pavana Das Babaji of Champahata should discourse with the Mullah Sahib. All the other Vaishnavas could also go to witness their discussion when the recitation of Sri Chaitanya Mangala was completed. Hearing this decision, the four Babajis loudly exclaimed, Jai Nityananda, and followed the Mahant to the large courtyard outside the temple. The Mullah and his company were seated in the pleasant cooling shade of a large banyan tree in the courtyard and they respectfully stood up to cordially receive the Vaishnavas. Knowing all jivas as servants of Krishna, the Vaishnavas in turn offered Dandavat to Sri Vasudev, situated in the heart of the Mula and his associates, and then took their respective seats. The setting was extraordinary to behold. On one side sat fifty well-dressed Muslim scholars with white beards, with their majestic, decorated stallions tethered behind them. On the other side, four Vaishnavas of divine appearance sat in a humble mood. Then in addition, many Hindus, feeling immense curiosity, came and sat behind them, and still others gathered around, sitting nearby. Pandit Gorachandra was the first to speak. He inquired, O oh great souls, why have you summoned such insignificant people as ourselves? Mullah Badruddin Sahib humbly replied, We desire to ask a few questions. Pandit Gorachandra said, What knowledge might we have that can possibly answer your erudite questions? Badruddin Sahib came a little closer and said, Brothers, the Devas and Devis have been worshipped in Hindu society since ancient times. Now, we see in our Quran Sharif that Allah is one, not two and that he has no form. It is an offence to make an image of him and worship it. I have a doubt about this issue, and I have consulted many Brahmana pundits in the hope of resolving it. Those pundits replied that Allah is actually formless. However, one cannot possibly conceive of that which has no form. Therefore, one should first make an imaginary form of Allah and meditate upon him by worshipping that form. However, I am not satisfied with this answer, because creating an imaginary form of Allah is the work of Satan. It is known as Bhut, and it is completely forbidden to worship it. Far from pleasing Allah, such worship only makes one subject to his punishment. We have heard that your original preceptor, Sri Chaitanya Dev, corrected all the faults in Hindu Dharma, yet his Sampradaya also makes provision for worshipping material forms. We want to know why you Vaishnavas have not given up the worship of material forms, although you are expert in the decisions of the Shastra. 
The Vaishnav pandits were inwardly amused at the Mullah's question. Outwardly, they declared, Pandit Gorachandra Mahashai, kindly give a suitable reply to the Mullah's question. Pandit Gorachandra said graciously, As you order, and proceeded to answer the question. Gorachandra He whom you refer to as Allah, we call Bhagavan. The Supreme Lord is one, but He is known by different names in the Quran, the Puranas, and in different countries and languages. The prime consideration is that the name which expresses all the Supreme Lord's characteristics is especially worthy of homage. For this reason, we have greater esteem for the name Bhagavan than for the names Allah, Brahman, and Paramatma. The word Allah refers to that being who has no superior, but we do not consider that greatness or supremacy is the highest characteristic of the Lord. Rather, the characteristic which evokes the highest degree of wonder, chamatkarti, and sweetness, maduri, is worthy of the utmost regard. Something that is exceedingly great inspires one type of wonder, but minuteness is a counterpart to greatness, and it inspires another type of wonder. Hence, the name Allah does not express the highest limit of wonder, because it expresses greatness but not minuteness. On the other hand, the word Bhagavan implies every type of wonder imaginable. The first characteristic of Bhagavan is complete Aishwarya, opulence which refers to the ultimate limit of greatness and minuteness. The second characteristic is that he is the most powerful because he possesses all shaktis, sarva shakti mata. That which is beyond the reach of human intellect is governed by Ishwara's achintya shakti, inconceivable potency, by which he simultaneously possesses form and is formless. If one thinks that Ishwara cannot have a form, one rejects his achintya shakti, by which Bhagavan manifests his eternal form and pastimes before his bhaktas. Allah, Brahma, or Paramatma are nirakara, formless, so they do not have any special wonderful characteristics. The third characteristic of Bhagavan is that he is always auspicious and all opulent, Mangalamaya, so that his pastimes are full of nectar. His fourth characteristic is that he possesses all beauty, Sundarya, and all living beings who are endowed with transcendental vision see him as the most beautiful person. Bhagavan's fifth characteristic is that he has limitless knowledge, Ashesh Gyan. This means he is pure, complete, omniscient, and transcendental to mundane matter. His form is the very embodiment of consciousness, and is beyond all material elements, Bhut. His sixth characteristic is that even though he is the master and controller of all jivas, he is unattached, near Lepa, and independent, Svatantra. These are Bhagavan's six primary characteristics. Bhagavan has two manifestations, his feature of Aishwarya, majesty, and his feature of Madhurya, sweetness. His Madhurya manifestation is the supreme friend for the jivas, and it is that personality known as Krishna or Chaitanya who is the lord of our hearts. You have said that worshipping some imaginary form of the lord is worship of material forms, Bhut Parast, and we also agree with that. The Dharma of the Vaishnavas is to worship the fully conscious eternal deity form of Bhagavan. Therefore, idolatry, Bhut Parast, is not part of the Vaishnava doctrine. One should clearly understand that the Vaishnava's worship of the deity is not idolatry. One cannot prohibit deity worship simply because some books prescribe idolatry. Everything depends on the quality of faith in the worshipper's heart. The more one's heart can transcend the influence of matter, the more competent one will be to worship the pure form of the deity. You are the Mullah Sahib, the chief of Muslim scholars, and your heart may be free from the influence of matter. But what about those of your disciples who are not so learned? Are their hearts free from all thoughts of matter? The more one is absorbed in thoughts of matter, 
the more he will be implicated in the worship of matter. Although he may claim that the Lord is formless, his heart is still filled with thoughts of matter. It is very difficult for the general mass of people to worship the pure form of the deity, for such worship is strictly a matter of personal qualification. In other words, only one who has been elevated beyond the influence of matter can transcend thoughts of material form. I sincerely request you to consider this subject carefully. Muller, I have considered your statement carefully. You say that Bhagavan refers to six astonishing attributes of the Supreme, and I have concluded that the Quran Sharif describes the same six qualities in relationship to the word Allah. There is no point arguing over the meaning of the word Allah. Allah is Bhagavan. Gorachandra, very good. If that is so, you must accept the beauty and opulence of the Supreme Being. It is then admitted that he possesses a splendid form in the spiritual world, which is distinct from the world of mundane matter. This is our divine deity form. Mullah, in our Quran it is written that the Supreme Entity has a divine, all-conscious form, so we are compelled to accept this fact. However, any image of that spiritual form is material. That is what we call Boot. The worship of Boot is not the worship of the Supreme Being. Please tell me your viewpoint on this. Gorachandra The Vaishnava Shastras explain how to worship the divine spiritual deity form of Bhagavan. Elevated devotees should not worship material objects composed of earth, water, fire, or other elements. It is said in the Srimad Bhagavatam 10.84.13 Yasyatma buddhi kunape tridatu ke svadi kalatra dishu boma ijyadi yat tirta buddhi salile na karhichi jane svabigeshu sa eva gokara If one considers this corpse-like body made of mucus, bile and air to be his real self, if he thinks his wife, children, and other bodily relatives his own, if one regards the worshipable deity form to be simply transformations of earth, such as wood or stone, or if one goes to a place of pilgrimage to take bath, but never hears from sadhus who are fully conversant with the absolute truth, such a person, although guised in a human form, is certainly no better than an ass or a cow. It is said in the Gita, 9.25 Bhutani Yanti Bhuteja Those who worship matter go to matter. We see from these and many other conclusive statements that there is no basis in Shastra for the worship of dead matter. There is an important point to consider in this. Human beings have different degrees of qualification according to their knowledge and sanskar. Only those who can understand pure spiritual existence are competent to worship the pure spiritual form of the deity. One's understanding is proportionate to one's development in this regard. Those who are the least eligible, Kanishta Adhikari, cannot understand the pure spiritual state of existence. Even when such people meditate on the Lord within their minds, the form that they imagine is material and meditating on a material form within the mind is the same as constructing a form of physical elements and regarding it as the Lord's form. That is why it is beneficial for a person on this level of eligibility to worship the deity. Factually speaking, it would be most inauspicious for the general class of people if there were no worship of deities. When ordinary jivas become inclined towards the service of the Lord, they become despondent if they cannot see the deity form of the Lord before them. In religions where there is no worship of the deity, members who are on a low level of spiritual qualification are highly materialistic and oblivious to Bhagavan. Therefore, worship of the deity is the foundation of religion for all humanity. The form of Bhagavan is revealed to the Mahajans through their trance of unalloyed Gyan Yoga and they meditate on that pure transcendental form in their hearts, which are purified by bhakti. 
When the Bhakta's heart is revealed to the world after continuous meditation, Sri Hari's transcendental form is reflected from the Bhakta's heart into this world. And when the divine form of the Lord is reflected in this way by the Mahajans, it becomes the form of the deity. The deity form is always Chinmaya, spiritual and conscious, for those who are on the highest platform of eligibility. Those on the intermediate level see the deity as endowed with perception and awareness, Manomaya. This means that the intermediate devotee has faith that the deity is conscious of his thoughts and prayers and accepts his mood of worship. However, the intermediate devotee, unlike the advanced devotee, does not directly perceive the deity as the spiritual all-conscious form of Sri Hari. Those on the lowest level initially see the deity as material, Jad Maya, but in time the deity reveals his pure spiritual form to the intelligence purified by spiritual love. Consequently, all classes of devotees should worship the deity form of Bhagavan. It is unnecessary to worship an imaginary form, but it is highly beneficial to worship Bhagavan's eternal deity form. The Vaishnava Sampradayas give this provision for people on these three levels of eligibility to worship the deity. There is no fault in this, for it is the only arrangement by which the jivas can gradually attain auspiciousness. This is confirmed in Srimad Bhagavatam 11.14.26. Yata yatatma parimrijayate sau, mat punya gata shravana bidhanai, tata tata pashyati vastu shukshman, chakshu yatai vagyana sam prayoktam. O Uddhava, as the eyes that are treated with therapeutic ointment can see very minute objects, similarly, when the heart is cleansed of material contamination by hearing and reciting the narrations of my supremely pure activities, it can see my subtle transcendental form, which is beyond the purview of matter. The Jivatma is covered by the material mind, and in this state he cannot know himself or render service to Paramatma. However, by performing sudden bhakti, which consists of hearing, chanting and other devotional practices, the Atma gradually develops spiritual power. As that power increases, material bondage slackens, and the more material bondage is relaxed, the more the soul's own nature comes into ascendancy. Thus one gradually attains direct perception of the Self and Ishwara, and engages directly in spiritual activities. Some people think one should endeavor to realize the Absolute Truth by rejecting all that is not truth, this is known as the cultivation of dry knowledge. What power does a conditioned soul have to renounce objects that are not inherently real? Can a prisoner who is confined to a cell liberate himself simply by desiring to do so? His objective should be to eradicate the offense that has placed him in bondage. The Jeev Atma's principal defect is that he has forgotten that he is an eternal servant of Bhagavan, and that is why he is bound by Maya and forced to suffer material happiness, distress, and repeated birth and death in this world. Although a person may initially be busy in sense gratification, if for some reason or another his mind becomes a little inclined towards Ishwara, and he regularly takes darshan of the deity, and hears Leela Kata, his innate bhav, nature, of being the servant of Sri Hari will be strengthened. The more strength this bhav develops, the more competent he becomes to perceive spirit directly. The only hope of spiritual progress for those who are the least spiritually qualified is to serve the deity and to hear and chant about Sri Hari. That is why the Mahajans have established service to the deity. Mullah, isn't meditating on a form of the Lord within one's mind superior to fashioning a form out of material elements? Gorachandra they are one and the same. The mind follows matter, and whatever it thinks of is also material. We may say that Brahman is all-pervading, but how can our minds actually conceive of this? We will be forced to think of it in terms of the all-pervasiveness of the sky. How can the mind go beyond this consideration? 
Our conception of Brahman is therefore constrained by the limitations of material space. If one says, I am meditating on Brahman, the experience of Brahman will be limited by material time, for it fades when one's meditation is concluded. How can the mind's meditation grasp an object that is above matter when it is conditioned by time and space, which are material phenomena? One may reject the idea that the form of the deity can consist of material elements such as earth and water, and one can imagine that Ishwara is situated in the directions or space, but still, this is all worship of matter. No material object can support one's attainment of the transcendental goal. The only thing that facilitates this is the awakening of the inclination towards Sri Hari. This inclination is inherent within the Jivatma and is gradually strengthened and converted into bhakti when one chants Sri Hari Nam, recites his pastimes and receives inspiration from beholding the deity. Sri Hari's spiritual form can be experienced only by pure bhakti, not by jnana and karma. Mula Matter is distinct from God. I think that it is better not to worship material objects, because it is said that Satan introduced the worship of matter to keep the living entities bound in the material world. Gorachandra Ishvara is one without a second, and he has no rival. Everything in this world is created by him and is under his control. Therefore, he can be satisfied with any object when it is used in his worship. There is no object in this world one can worship that can arouse his malice, for he is all auspicious. Even if a person such as Satan exists, he is no more than a special jiva under the control of God and has no power to do anything that is opposed to God's will. However, in my opinion, it is not possible for such a monstrous living entity to exist. No activity can take place that is contrary to the will of Ishwara, nor is any living entity independent of the Lord. You may ask, what is the origin of sin? My answer is as follows. Vidya, knowledge, is the understanding that the jivas are servants of Bhagavan, and avidya, ignorance, is forgetfulness of this. All jivas who, for whatever reason, take shelter of avidya, sow the seed of all sins in their hearts, whereas the seeds of sin cannot stay in the hearts of those jivas who are eternal associates of Bhagavan. One should understand this truth of avidya carefully, instead of imagining an extraordinary myth about Satan. It means that it is not an offense to worship the Lord in material elements. Worship of the deity is most essential for those of low spiritual eligibility, and it is particularly auspicious for people of high spiritual eligibility. It is mere dogma to think that the worship of the deity is not good. There is no logic or evidence from Shastra to support this position. Mula, the inclination toward God, cannot be stimulated by worship of the deity, because the mind of one who performs such worship always remains confined to the properties of matter. Gorachanda We can understand the defect in your theory by studying the ancient historical accounts of those who became great devotees. Many people began to worship the deity while they were neophytes, but as their devotional mood developed through the association of pure devotees, their realization of the transcendental and conscious nature of the deity also increased, and eventually they became immersed in the ocean of Prem. The irrevocable conclusion is that satsanga is the root of all spiritual advancement. When one associates with bhaktas of Sri Hari, who are fully situated in divine consciousness, one awakens transcendental affection towards Sri Hari. The more this transcendental affection increases, the more the material idea of the deity vanishes, and through great good fortune this divine consciousness gradually unfolds. In contrast, the advocates of non-Aryan religions generally oppose deity worship, but just consider how many of them have attained spiritual realization, chin my above. They waste their time in useless and malicious arguments. When have they experienced true devotion to Bhagavan? Mula, 
There is no fault if one performs internal bhajan of God in a mood of love and externally engages in the worship of the deity. However, how can it be worship of God to worship a dog, a cat, a serpent, or a debauchee? Our revered prophet, Paigambara Sahib, has vehemently condemned such worship of material objects. Gorachanda All human beings are grateful to God. No matter how many sins they commit, occasionally they become aware that God is the supreme entity, and when they are endowed with this belief, they bow down before the extraordinary things of this world. When ignorant people are inspired by their gratitude to God, they naturally offer respect to the sun, a river, a mountain, or to enormous animals. They express their hearts before such things and display submission to them. Granted, there is a vast difference between this type of worship of material objects and transcendental affection towards the Lord. Still, when such ignorant people adopt a mood of gratitude to God and reverence towards material objects, it gradually produces a positive effect. Therefore, if one examines the situation logically, one cannot ascribe any fault to them. Meditation on the formless, all-pervading feature of the Lord and offering namaz and other types of prayers to an impersonal aspect of the Lord are also devoid of pure transcendental love. So how are these methods any different from the worship of a cat, for example? We consider that it is essential to arouse Bhav towards Bhagavan by any means possible. The door leading to gradual elevation is firmly shut if people on any level of worship are ridiculed or condemned. Those who fall under the spell of dogmatism and therefore become sectarian lack the qualities of generosity and munificence. That is why they ridicule and condemn others who do not worship in the same way as they do. This is a great mistake on their part. Mullah Then must we conclude that everything is God and that to worship anything at all is worship of God? That would mean that worship of sinful objects or the sinful tendency is also worship of God. Do all these different types of worship please God? Gorachanda we do not say that everything is God. On the contrary, God is distinct from all these things. God creates and controls everything, and everything has a relationship with Him. The thread of that relationship runs through everything, and that is why one may inquire about the presence of God in all things. As one inquires into the presence of God in all things, one can gradually taste or experience the supreme transcendental unconscious entity. This is expressed in the sutra, Jignasa Asvadanavadi. Inquiry leads to experience. You are all learned pundits. If you kindly consider this matter in a generous mood, you will understand. We Vaishnavas are completely disinterested in material things, and we do not want to enter into long drawn out arguments. If you kindly permit us, we shall now leave you to listen to the sublime narration of Sri Chaitanya Mangala. It was not evident what conclusion the Mullah Sahib reached as a result of this discussion. After a short silence he said, I have been pleased to hear your point of view. On another day I will return and inquire further. Now it is late and I wish to return home. He and his party then mounted their horses and departed for Satsaika Parangana. The Babaji's loudly uttered the name of Sri Hari with great delight and entered the temple to hear the recitation of Sri Chaitanya Mangala. Thus ends the eleventh chapter of Jaiva Dharma entitled Nitya Dharma and Idolatry. <laughs>